ಅಹಂಗಂತೆ ತೀಸರನೇನ ಸಹ ಪಂಚಶೀಲಾನೀಯ ಚಾಮಿ ದ್ವಿತೀಯಂಪಿ ಅಹಂಗಂತೆ ತೀಸರನೇನ ಸಹ ಪಂಚಶೀಲಾನೀಯ ಚಾಮಿ ತತ್ಯಂಪಿ ಅಹಂಗಂತೆ ತೀಸರನೇನ ಸಹ ಪಂಚಶೀಲಾನಿ ಯಾಮಿ ನಮೋ ತಸ ಭಗವತೋ ಅರ್ಹತೋ ಸಮ ಸಂಬುಧಸ 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 ಬುಧಂಗ್ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ಬುಧಂಗ್ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ಧಮ್ಮಂಗ್ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ಧಮ್ಮಂಗ್ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ಸಂಘಂಗ್ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ಸಂಘಂಗ್ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ದ್ವಿತೀಯಂಪಿ ಬುಧಂಗ್ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ದ್ವಿತೀಯಂಪಿ ಬುಧಂಗ್ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ದ್ವಿತೀಯಂಪಿ ಧಮ್ಮಂಗ್ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ದ್ವಿತೀಯಂಪಿ ಧಮ್ಮಂಗ್ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ದ್ವಿತೀಯಂಪಿ ಸಂಘಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ದ್ವಿತೀಯಂಪಿ ಸಂಘಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ತತ್ಯಂಪಿ ಬುಧಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ತತ್ಯಂಪಿ ಬುಧಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ತತ್ಯಂಪಿ ಧಮ್ಮಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ತತ್ಯಂಪಿ ತಮ್ಮಂಗ್ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ತತ್ಯಂಪಿ ಸಂಘಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ತತ್ಯಂಪಿ ಸಂಘಂ ಶರಣ ಗಚಾಮಿ ತೀ ಶರಣಗಮನಂ ನಿಥಿತಂ ಆಮಂತೆ ಪಾನಾತಿ ಪಾಠ ವೀರಮನಿ ಶಿಖಾ ಪದಂ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಾಮಿ ಪಾನಾತಿ ಪಾತ ವೀರಮಣಿ ಶಿಖಾ ಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಾಮಿ ಅದಿನ್ನ ದಾನ ವೀರಮಣಿ ಶಿಖಾ ಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಾಮಿ ಅದಿನ್ನ ದಾನ ವೀರಮಣಿ ಶಿಖಾ ಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಾಮಿ ಆಮೇಸು ಮೀಚಾಚಾರ ವೀರಮಣಿ ಶಿಖಾ ಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಾಮಿ ಕಾಮೀಸು ಮೀಚಾಚಾರ ವೀರಮಣಿ ಶಿಖಾ ಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಾಮಿ ಮೋಸಾವಾದ ವೀರಮಣಿ ಶಿಖಾ ಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಾಮಿ ಮುಸಾವಾದ ವೀರಮಣಿ ಶಿಖಾ ಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಾಮಿ ಸುರಮೇರಯ ಮಜ್ಜಪಮಾಡಾನ ವೀರಮಣಿ ಶಿಖಾ ಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಾಮಿ ಸುರಮೇರಯ ಮಜ್ಜಪಮಾಡಾನ ವೀರಮಣಿ ಶಿಖಾ ಪದ ಸಮಾಧಿಯಾಮಿ ಇಮಿ ಪಂಚ ಶಿಖಾ ಪದ ಶೀಲೇನ ಸುಗತಿಂತಿ ಶೀಲೇನ ಭೋಗ ಸಂಪದ ಶೀಲೇನ ನಿಪುಟಿಂಗಂತಿ ತಸ್ಮಾ ಶೀಲಂ ವಿಸೋಧಾಯೇ ಸಾಧು 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 ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ತ್ರೀ ಪ್ಯಾರಾಗ್ರಾಫ್ ಒನ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಏಟ್ ವಿತ್ ಅ ಸಿನ್ಸಿಯರ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ಲಿನೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಹಾರ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸಿನ್ಸಿಯರ್ ರೆಸೊಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ದ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಟರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ಲಿನೇಷನ್ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ಸಿನ್ಸಿಯರ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಮೋಡ್ಸ್ beginning with non greed for it is one of such sincere inclination who arrives at one of the three kinds of enlightenment according as it is said six kinds of inclination lead to maturing of enlightenment of bodhisattvas with the inclination to non greed 
bodhisattvas see the fault and greed. With the inclination to non-hate, bodhisattvas see the fault and hate. With the inclination to non-delusion, bodhisattvas see the fault and delusion. With the inclination to renunciation, bodhisattvas see the fault and house life. With the inclination to seclusion, bodhisattvas see the fault in society. With the inclination to relinquishment, bodhisattvas see the fault in all kinds of becoming and destiny. For stream enterers, once returners, non returners, those with cankers destroyed, arahants, pacheka buddhas, and fully enlightened ones, whether past, future, or present, all arrive at a distinction peculiar to each by means of these same six modes. That is why he should have sincerity of inclination in those six modes. He should be wholeheartedly resolved on that. The meaning is that he should be resolved upon concentration, respect concentration, inclination to concentration, be resolved upon Nibbana, respect Nibbana, incline to Nibbana. Bhante, uh, what just, just I read about the inclinations. Um, is this like uh, happening like naturally in the in these kind of persons, or um, it's something that needs to be cultivated, and it's something that uh, we we should always be like remind ourselves before practicing or something like that. That's a good question. I mean, some of it is done in the uh, in the opening ceremony. Probably that's where it's mainly done. I'm just trying to think if there's room for some sort of practice. I mean, this is the kind of thing you could incorporate into a daily chanting, perhaps. I don't know if there's anything here. I guess uh, the biggest thing is to check yourself, check your, your inclination, and like, remind yourself of these six things. It's, it's valuable. It's not something you actually hear about, something worth talking about. Six kinds of inclination. Hungry, non-hate, non-delusion, renunciation, seclusion, and relinquishment. Source untraced. Well, that's interesting. I don't suppose we could find it. He didn't have our search capacities back then, but I'm I'm assuming still untraced. Thirty. When with sincerity of inclination and wholehearted resolution in this way, he asks for a meditation subject, then a teacher who has acquired the penetration of minds can know his temperament by surveying his mental conduct. And a teacher who, who has not can know it by putting such questions to him as, what is your temperament or what states are usually present in you? Or what do you like bringing to mind? Or what meditation subjects does your mind favor? When he knows, he can expound a meditation subject suitable to that temperament. And in doing so, he can expound it in three ways. It can be expounded to one who has already learned the meditation subject by having him recite it at one or two sessions. It can be expounded to one who lives in the same place each time he comes, and to one who wants to learn it and then go elsewhere. It can be expounded in such a manner that is neither too brief nor too long. So these six ajasaya, these six inclinations, are elsewhere in the commentaries. Here's one, Ajasaya Bodhi, Bodhi Paripakya, lead to Bodhi, lead to the maturity of enlightenment, just in the commentaries. But it's, it's a 
a good one to think about and remind yourselves, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty um, pretty core. I mean, obviously, greed, anger, and delusion are something that we talk about and think about. And it's a core part of our practice. Uh, but the set of six is valuable, putting it that way. What should we be intent upon in our practice, these six things? What should be our inclination? Inclined on towards non-greed, non-anger, non-delusion, renunciation, seclusion, and relinquishment. Herein, when, when first he is explaining the earth casina, there are nine aspects that he should explain. They are the four faults of the casina, the making of a casina, the method of development for one who has made it, the two kinds of sign, the two kinds of concentration, seven kinds of suitable and unsuitable, the ten kinds of skill and absorption, evenness of energy, and the directions of absorption. In the case of the other meditation subjects, each should be expounded in the way appropriate to it. All this will be made clear in the directions for development. When the meditation subject is being expounded in this way, the meditator must apprehend the sign as he listens. 132. Apprehend the sign means that he must connect each aspect thus. This is the preceding clause. This is the subsequent clause. This is its meaning. This is its intention. This is the simile. When he listens attentively, apprehending the sign in this way, his meditation subject is well apprehended. Then, and because of that, he successfully attains distinction, but not otherwise. This clarifies the meaning of the words, and he must apprehend. At this point, the clauses approach the good friend, the giver of a meditation subject, and he should apprehend from among the 40 meditation subjects one that suits his own temperament, have been expounded in detail in all their aspects. The third chapter called the description of taking a meditation subject and the treatise on the development of concentration in the path of purification composed for the purpose of gladdening good people. This is how chapters are enumerated in the ancient text. The very end of the chapter has the name of it. Sometimes not even saying it has ended. Sometimes it says nitita or nititang or something, but here it doesn't even say ended. Actually, the, he's missing a thus. Yeah, there should be a thus. So it it really is. It start. It should be thus the third chapter, or this is the third chapter. So I think he's missing that in his translation. Um, one thirty three. It's it's probably confusing if you're not precise on what what he's talking about, because the grammar's all wrong. But what it it actually should say is at this point the clauses and then the quotation mark because the rest of it is is clauses right it's by clauses here he means statements that were made earlier so the the statements or the 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 title the passages that were spoken already or written already approach a good friend was one approach a good friend the giver of meditation subject and the other is he should apprehend from among the 40 meditation subjects one that suits his own temperament. So those should be in quotes. There's two clauses. Approach the good friend, the giver of meditation subject is one. And the second is, he should apprehend from among, da, 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 and so on. So those two clauses have been expounded in detail in their aspects. If it wasn't clear, that's the meaning there. Otherwise, pretty self-explanatory. I mean, this is all, all quite interesting, and practically speaking, this is the the mechanics of how you begin 
you know, begin to undertake meditation, even though we're a lot of this is going to be uh, more broad based. It's still this is very much in line with how we we undertake the practice of any type of meditation in Buddhism, being sincere and dedicated, and having the right uh, focus on the six inclinations, for example, and and the wholehearted resolve that we're practicing for nibbana. So the next chapter is called the Bhattavi Kasina Nidesa on the Earth Kasina, but it doesn't yet start talking about we're, we're not we're not really there yet. I don't think we're even all that close to actually talking about the Bhattavi Kasina. We may be fairly close, but there's still quite a bit to talk about. At least several pages. Chapter four The Earth Casino Bhattavi Casina Nidesa. One. Now, it was said earlier, after that he should avoid a monastery unfavorable unfavor to the development of concentration and go to live in one that is favorable. In the first place, one who finds it convenient to live with the teacher in the same monastery can live there while he is making certain of the meditation subject. If it is inconvenient there, he can live in another monastery, a suitable one, a quarter or a half or even a whole league distance. In that case, when he finds he is in doubt about or has forgotten some passage in the meditation subject, then he should do the duties in the monastery in good time and set out afterwards going for alms on the way and arriving at the teacher's dwelling place after his meal. He should make certain about the meditation subject that day in the teacher's presence. Next day, after paying homage to the teacher, he should go for alms on his way back and so he can return to his own dwelling place without fatigue. But one who finds no convenient place within even a league should clarify all difficulties about the meditation subject and make quite sure it has been properly attended to. Then he can even go far away and, avoiding the monastery unfavorable unfavor to development of concentration, live in one that is favorable. So um, I don't think it mean I don't think it actually says well he is making certain of the meditation subject. It sounds like I don't know. I mean, obviously this is just a cursory look, but it sounds odd, doesn't it? Making certain. It sounds like he's saying well he's um, well. I, mean, I guess the idea he's getting at is make certain, make clear in one's mind. So making sure one has no doubts and so on. But the word it uses in the Pali is. Pariso Dena, which uh, means to cleanse, to purify, which I guess amounts to the same thing, but I guess it, it, it's, it's rather than to uh, make certain, to make clear. So while he's still learning and uh, trying to understand it, sometimes you can't stay with your teacher, so if you can't stay nearby, you should clarify all everything make sure you're settled in it and you've got it perfectly clear in your mind before you go away if you have to go away learn all you can from the teacher but ideally of course you stay in the monastery obviously you stay in the monastery with the teacher is the best but sometimes the monastery can be unfavorable it's interesting to consider that um, someone who has gained the, the basics and or not the basics, but gain the fundamentals of meditation practice is often better off uh, going somewhere else to practice, practicing on their own, and not spending too much time with a teacher, because often a teacher will be in a monastery that isn't all, actually all that suitable, especially for samatha. Again, a lot of this is much more heavily geared towards the practice of samatha meditation, 
which requires or more requires a peaceful, quiet, secluded place. And the same goes with the 18 faults of a monastery. Or sorry, I guess that is the, the what we're going to talk about. So the 18 faults of a monastery do have much more to do with samatha than vipassana. But it's also useful for vipassana as well. Sometimes it's best if it's not busy, the the monastery is not that busy or something. So uh, It can be. I mean, there's there's a lot of benefit to being around other people practicing, and mm. uh, there's also benefit in being challenged to some extent. I mean, it, it's complicated. If you go off on your own, it's, of course, in both kinds of meditation, easy to develop bad habits if there's no one to correct them. The 18 faults of a monastery to hear one that is unfavorable has anyone of 18 faults. These are one, largeness, two, newness, three, dilapidatedness. For a nearby road, five, a pond, six, edible leaves, seven, flowers, eight, fruit, nine, famousness, ten, a nearby city, eleven, nearby timber trees, twelve, nearby arable fields, thirteen, presence of incompatible persons 14 a nearby port of entry 15 nearness to the border countries 16 nearness to the frontier of a kingdom 17 unsuitability 18 lack of good friends one with any of these faults is not favorable. He should not live there. Why? So he means one who is intent upon, I mean, obviously one who is intent upon taking meditation, which goes without saying, but the meaning is specifically those. None of these 18 things is really an actual fault of the monastery, though maybe presence of incompatible persons, perhaps, but even still, this is specifically for one who has temporarily, perhaps temporarily, undertaken this task of doing of intensive meditation. So valuable to think about, but uh, don't get the idea that this is something. There's something wrong with new monasteries or large monasteries or roads or ponds or so on. He's just going to explain why they can interfere with your practice, especially samatha practice. Firstly, people with varying aims collect in a large monastery. They conflict with each other and so neglect the duties. The enlightenment tree, terrace, etc. remain unswept. The water for drinking and washing is not set out. So if he thinks, I shall go to the alms resort village for alms and takes his bowl and robe, and sets out, perhaps he sees that the duties have not been done, or that a drinking water pot is empty, and so the duty has to be done by him unexpectedly. Drinking water must be maintained. By not doing it, he would commit a wrongdoing in the breach of a duty, but if he does it, he loses time. He arrives too late at the village and gets nothing because the almsgiving is finished. Also, when he goes into retreat, he is distracted by the loud noises of novices and young bhikkhus and by acts of the community being carried out. However, he can live in a large monastery where all the duties are done and where there are none of the other disturbances. In a new monastery, there is much new building activity. People criticize someone who takes no part in it, but he can live in such a monastery where the bhikkhu says, let the venerable one 
do the aesthetics duties as much as he likes. We shall see to the building work. In a dilapidated monastery, there is much that needs repair. People criticize someone who does not see about the repairing, but at least his own lodging. When he sees to the repairs, his meditation subject suffers. In a monastery with a nearby road, by a main street, visitors keep arriving night and day. He has to give up his own lodging to those who came late, and he has to go and live at the root of a tree or on top of a rock. And next, and next day, it is the same. So there is no opportunity to practice his meditation subject, but he can live in one where there is no such disturbance by visitors. Meaning here has got to be other monks. It's interesting that that should be such a thing. I, I guess in areas where there are lots of monks. Um, but this can only be referring to a lot of monk visitors. And it's surprised that there would be such traffic just because it's near a road. I guess it makes sense in places where there are lots of monks. Because um, the, the giving up of, of lodgings is for senior monks. If senior monks come, then the senior monks get the, get the rooms or get the better rooms. And uh, the junior monks actually have to go and live under a tree. We might have this issue in Sri Lanka. We uh, to start. We don't. We're, we're going to work as hard and as quickly as possible to uh, get more rooms. But at the moment, we have not enough bathrooms actually. So we're looking into that. But uh, interesting to note. Maybe we'll see if some of the monks will sleep under will sleep at the root of a tree. They can't actually. That's that's actually uh, not possible because it's the rains. We have enough rooms. We just don't have enough bathrooms, so we should be okay. Abante, is it at the actual root of a tree, or they can use tents? Well, they can use a mosquito net, but a tent wouldn't be wouldn't be at the root of a tree. It would be in a tent. But, um, I mean, I, I guess. Yeah, there's um, there's some talk about tents, how tents work. What are tents? Because you could you could have a robe tent. Is something that they make. I'm not sure. I, I don't think it addressed that in the in the Dutanga. But um, practically speaking, you should have a mosquito net because of mosquito-borne illnesses. Uh, Seven point five. A pond is a rock pool. Numbers of people come there for drinking water. Pupils of city-dwelling elders, supported by the royal family, come to do dying work. When they ask for vessels, wood, tubs, etc., they must be shown where these things are. So he is kept all the time on the alert. If he goes with his meditation subject to sit by day, where there are many sorts of edible leaves, then women, vegetable gatherers, singing as they pick leaves nearby, endanger his meditation subject by disturbing it with the sounds of the opposite sex. Where there are many sorts of flowering shrubs in bloom, there is the same danger too. Paragraph number nine. Where there are many sorts of fruits, such as mangoes, rose apples, and jackfruits. People who want fruits come and ask for them. And they get angry if he does not give them any, or they take them by force. When walking in the monastery in the evening, he sees them and asks, Why do you do so, lay followers? They abuse him as they please and even try to evict him. 10. When he lives in a monastery, 
that is famous and renowned in the world, like Dakina Giri, Hati Kuchi, Chitiya Giri, and Chitala Baba. Da. There are always people coming who want to pay homage to him, supposing that he is an Arahant, which inconveniences him. But if it suits him, he can live there at night and go elsewhere by day. 11.10. When one with a nearby city, objects of the opposite sex come into focus. Women pot carriers go by bumping into him with the jars and giving no room to pass. Also, important people spread out carpets in the middle of the monastery and sit down. 12.11. One with the nearby timber trees, where there are timber trees, and osiers useful for making framework is inconvenient because of the wood gatherers there, like the gatherers of ranches and fruits already mentioned. If there are trees in a monastery, people come and cut them down to build houses with. When he has come out of his meditation room in the evening and is walking up and down in the monastery, if he sees them and asks, why do you do so, lay followers? They abuse him as they please and even try to evict him. 13. 12. People make use of one with nearby arable fields, quite surrounded by fields. They make a threshing floor in the middle of the monastery itself. They thresh corn there, dry it in the four courts, and cause great inconvenience. And where there is extensive property belonging to the community, the monastery attendants impound kettle belonging to families and deny the water supply to their crop. Then people bring an ear of paddy and show it to the community saying, look at your monastery attendants work. For one reason or another, he has to go to the portals of the king or the king's ministers. This matter of property belonging to the community is included by a monastery that is near arable fields. Presence of incompatible persons where there are bhikkhus living who are incompatible and mutually hostile when they clash and it is protested, venerable sirs do not do so, they exclaim. We no longer count now that this refuse rag wearer has come. 15, 14. One with a nearby water port of entry or land port of entry is made inconvenient by people constantly arriving respectively by ship or by caravan and crowding round asking for space or for drinking water or, or salt. In the case of one near the border countries, people have no trust in the Buddha, etc. there. That's interesting. That's talking about us um, non-Buddhists. Don't go to stay in the monastery outside of a, outside of a Buddhist country. You should be surrounded by people. It is an issue, really. It's a big issue that you'll be surrounded by people with dubious views, uh, having to meet with people who are not Buddhist, who didn't grow up Buddhist, who come to Buddhism with their own interpretations. It's something we always have to be cautious about. Like in a group like this, we're mostly non-Buddhists, right? There's some of us here who grew up Buddhist, but most of us didn't grow up Buddhist. And we have to be very careful in groups like this that we uh, we don't start to as a group allow our distorted perceptions to take root and to guide our understanding something to always keep in mind that it's easy to have your view influenced by people around you 
Of course, it's it's not to say that it's not possible, but it's harder. And, and it is easy for wrong views and wrong interpretations to crop up. Because, I mean, you might be a great person, you might be great, great people, but if you spent many, many years steeped in wrong views, then uh, you're missing something that is an integral part of a Buddhist culture, a Buddhist society, that they, even though their, their precepts may not have been perfect, but people who grew up with a knowledge of and a familiarity with the teaching of the Buddha, it would be quite valuable. But they, can you give a, a, an example for this? Well, there are these Western communities that have decided that the commentaries are wrong or that uh, have given up on the Abhidhamma, for example. Those are some pretty extreme examples. I went to a, I went to a talk given by a Western monk, a Canadian monk in Toronto many years ago. My first, my first year as a monk, I went get, to listen to this talk and he has some odd views himself, but the audience had the strangest views. <laughs> they would, like when it came time for questions, some of them, instead of asking questions, would remark things, and uh, they were the most bizarre. That being said, some of the most bizarre Buddhist views I've ever heard are from Buddhists in Colombo. <laughs> so, is Sanka here? No, Sanka's not here. But I think he would probably agree with me. It's It's incredible how mess how, how how perverse some of the views of scholars in in buddhist countries can be you're not safe just because you live in a buddhist country of course this is uh, this is him talking about the difference between the area where the buddha was that was full at the time of enlightened beings and and uh, you know much closer to the buddhist teaching than we are today so even in Thailand and Sri Lanka, Buddhism is not nearly as strong as it would have been when he was talking. The environment that he was talking about is long gone. So everywhere is kind of a border country. I mean, Thailand, he would have considered very much a border country. Sri Lanka is still a border country. Certainly not, not the main stronghold of Buddhism by any means. But there is still stronger orthodoxies in these countries. Sri Lanka is a bit shaky in some ways. Thailand is pretty orthodox in their own way. Their biggest problem is they have Thai orthodoxy, which isn't, well, it's not their biggest, it isn't a huge problem, but it is something to be wary of. Thai orthodoxy can be perverse. Perverse, I mean, like, just distorted. Burma has a very strong orthodoxy as well. And I think most of Burmese orthodoxy is good. I think sometimes they can be dogmatic. 16. In one near the frontier of a kingdom, there is fear of kings. For perhaps one king attacks the place thinking, it does not submit to my rule. And the other does likewise thinking, it does not submit to my rule. A bhikkhu lives there when it is conquered by one king and when it is conquered by the other. Then they suspect him of spying and they bring about his undoing. This actually apparently was a thing where spies would disguise themselves as Buddhist monks in Burma and Thailand when they were fighting. 17. Unsuitability is that due to the risk of encountering visible data, etc., of the opposite sex as objects, or to hunting by non-human beings. Here is a story. An elder lived in a forest, it seems. Then an ogress stood in the door of his leaf hut and sang. The elder came out and stood in the door. She went to the end of the walk and sang. The elder went to the end of the walk. She stood in a chasm a hundred fathoms deep and sang. The elder recoiled. Then she suddenly grabbed him, saying, Venerable sir, it is not just one or two of the likes of you I have eaten. Not sure about the lesson there, but I guess avoid female demons if you can. The real lesson is don't follow after pleasant sounds and sights, smells and tastes and feelings. 18. Lack of good friends. 
where it is not possible to find a good friend as a teacher or the equivalent of a teacher or a preceptor or the equivalent of a preceptor, the lack of good friends, there is a serious fault. One that has any of those 18 faults should be understood as unfavorable. And this is said in the commentaries. A large abode, a new abode, one tumbling down, one near a road, one with a pond or leaves or flowers or fruits or one that people seek. In cities among timber fields where people quarrel in a port, in borderlands, on frontiers, unsuitableness and no good friend. These are the 18 instances a wise man needs to recognize and give them full as wide a birth as any footpad hunted road. So lack of a good friend would mean uh, if, if you don't, you can't get a teacher basically, right? Right. Is that even possible, such places that there is not even one teacher? I think you'd better off be asking, is it possible that you can find a place that has a teacher? It's a very rare thing. Oh. We don't have nearly enough teachers. Thailand's kind of doing a good job uh, sending out teachers at the moment. A bante for teacher. Is it a teacher of the Dhamma or of meditation or of um, a teacher of a new monk? I mean, here it's quite likely just talking about meditation teaching. So Nita asks about paragraph eight, and I guess it's about um, the women vegetable gatherers. Is that a problem for Bikunis? No, but... Um... You know, there'll be problem with male f gatherers. I mean, barring barring homosexuality, it's yeah. It'll be, there will be just as much issue with male workers, for example, in the fields. There'll be male laborers, and fruit pickers are quite often male. Flowers, yeah, flowers maybe not so much. It's traditionally more of a women thing, but hey, you know, modern times are not. I think it would have been traditionally more 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 women in in societies where women were expected to pick flowers, whatever. Leaves, I don't know. Um, I think probably both. When I mean, you just you just switch to men, there's still going to be problems with men. The problem with people is the whole point. I mean, it's even worse in some ways. I mean, women are are vulnerable to the uh, to to sexual assault. So, uh, yeah, you want to avoid any place that attracts men for, for obvious reasons and maybe not so obvious reasons as well. But the paragraph 10, when um, it talks about the famous, renowned monasteries, and like for me, it was a little bit confusing, like Dakinagiri, Hati, Hachi, Kuchi, etc. So, and then it says that there are, people are coming to pay homage to him, supposing that he is an arahant. But these names are not the not the supposed arahant's names, right? It, it's the those are the uh, names of the monasteries. Monasteries, yes. And then it switches to talk about suddenly uh, about supposed arahant. Well, it's the type of people that these places attract. They attract basically tourists, well, pilgrims, I guess. People who are looking for, people will often go to these places looking for um, some miracle cure to their illnesses, pilgrims. If you read up about pilgrimage, we learned about this in religious studies in university. We had a class that talked about pilgrimage, and uh, they're very much convinced that if they go on a pilgrimage, they can be cured of illnesses. and. 
and uh, cure the poverty and that sort of thing. So um, it's the kind of people who would be looking for a monk to bless them and that sort of thing, and it can be a bother. I mean, it, it, we, of course, all the time get people coming to bless us and offer us gifts. Today, actually, I was sitting in, in the reporting room and some people brought me some dates, uh, raw dates. Uh, I didn't even know what they were. And they explained, I don't know if I've ever seen raw dates before anyway. So I bring that up because it's it's nice when people offer you things, of course, right? But when you're in, engaged in meditation, it can be a real bother having to deal with people coming all the time, even if they just want to offer you things. That's not what you need, right? You don't need material wealth or material goods. You need to be left alone. I mean, I guess I misunderstood here several things, but uh, in my mind, it was that um, it's how can that be an inconvenient that an arahant lives in the specific monastery, for example? Is it isn't that mm. like great? To be no, it's terrible. Arahant. No? No, they're supposing he, the meditator, is an arahant. I think you're misunderstanding what it's saying. It's saying they think he, the meditator, is an arahant. Oh, yes, I did. Yes, okay. So he can stay there at night and then just run away during the day, sneak back after everyone has, has gone home. I have a question about the previous chapter. Um Paragraph 131, when it's talking about the earth casino and absorption, it it says, or it refers to, and the directions for absorption. What, what does it mean by directions for absorption? I believe it's the instructions that lead to absorption. And then when it says two kinds of concentration, that's like... Um, um, i trying to think of the terms, like access concentration and... I don't know what the one after that would be. I thought the one after that was just called absorption, but maybe I'm wrong. But is that what it's referring to, with two kinds of concentration? Yeah. Thank you. Apana vidana. 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 Vidana is the word for direction. It means the process by which one enters into absorption. Well, it could mean something else. Uh, I think it just means the process by which one attains absorption. I want to go back to the six uh, inclinations here. It's something that was that was uh, rubbed me the wrong way, or was it like, that was didn't sit right with me? I don't think it's saying. Hmm, yeah, maybe maybe his translation's okay, but it sounds like if you read the translation that the cause is the inclination to non-greed, and the result is seeing the fault in greed, which doesn't make any sense. It should be the opposite, right? You see the fault in greed, and thereby inclined to non-greed. But it, the, his translation makes it sound the opposite. And I don't think the Pali is saying that. I mean, it wouldn't make sense anyway, would it? Yeah, what it's saying is the bodhisattva, yeah, you have to say it this way because the with there is not with in the sense of uh, with this as a cause. It's the bodhisattvas have. The bodhisattva with the inclination to non-greed sees the fault in greed. In other words, it's concurrent. It's at the same time. It means they dwell as someone who sees the fault in greed and has the inclination of non-greed, or having the having the inclination to non-greed sees the fault in greed, or his one who has seen already, which is not what it's saying, but that's the meaning as far as I can see. It's not. It's just the word "with" is uh, ambiguous there, because we would often phrase it like this when we say "with," meaning because of. The inclination to love, but that's not what the with here means. The with here means having the bodhisattva having the inclination to non greed sees the fault in greed, in other words, or is one literally means is one who sees the fault, in other words, the because, um, the reason, no, um, 
the only way that they can have the inclination to non-greed is because they see the fault in greed. So in other words, when you see someone with the inclination to non-greed, you know that they see the fault in greed. Anyway, I'm, I'm belaboring the point, but I just want to be clear that it's just a minor point, but it didn't sit right to think that the inclination to non-greed leads to the seeing the fault in greed. Panta, earlier when you talked about uh, Thailand and Sri Lanka, you used the word orthodoxy, and for me it was a bit misleading because uh, did you use the word in terms of uh, conforming to the approved philosophy of, of, of Buddhism or the branch of Christianity, which is called orthodoxy? Well, it's called orthodoxy because that's what it means. They they claim to be ascribing to the real and true and mainstream teachings. It's the opposite of heterodoxy, I believe. You can look up these terms. An opinion or doctrine or a system of doctrines contrary to some established standard of faith. Heterodoxy and orthodoxy. So in Christianity, there was something called Antiquity, ecumenical councils in antiquity. I guess with the, I guess all that. I don't know why they capitalized the word antiquity. Maybe it means something. But there are these ancient creeds and councils that uh, they say. Well, that's the orthodoxy. Just so, in the same way, we say the commentaries uh, are the orthodoxy. If you want to call yourself Theravada, technically, you should accept the commentaries. And if you don't accept the commentaries, it's hard to really say that you're Theravada, though, you know, it's all up to interpretation. People have different opinions and different ideas, and they're just words, of course. I was, I was going to say, a lot of the, the history we get around Buddhism and how we know what certain things means com comes from the commentaries. I think a, a lot of times, especially people uh, coming from a Western background, when they're uh, unsure of the commentaries or skeptical of them I, I think a lot of times they've just n never read them and uh, aren't aware of what they inform on and and things like that like a lot of people they'll you know maybe grow up in one religion leave it and then they'll be real skeptical about learning other religions so they you know take the time to to learn some of the historic background of like the suttas and stuff they'll get comfortable with that and they'll they'll never look into the commentaries to the same degree and they'll just kind of assume well it came later it must be something else without really understanding what they are i think more of the issue is their their whole environment allows for the hostility maybe not breeds it but at least allows for it they never had the experience of teachers teaching the commentaries or teaching from the commentaries so it's very it's a, it's foreign and I guess leading to what you say that it's it's uncomfortable, like they're not comfortable with them. But it's uh, more to do I think with the environment that some of these groups uh, grow up in. Like I come from a Western Orthodox, a Western sorry Western culture, but I was like dumped right into a very Orthodox, a very very. It's an interesting thing is. When I first started, I, it actually wasn't. The teacher, it's maybe a sort of an example of this. My first teacher was a layman, and he he had very little knowledge, and he admitted he had very little knowledge about the, the, the Buddhist theory. But the environment allowed for this sort of anti-intellectual sentiment. Like studying the Visuddhimagga would never really have been a part of our, our community. Let alone, and it really is... Not not studying the Dhamma at all. It was never really a part of what we did. It's it's not like there was any discouragement, but it was just we became comfortable and complacent in just going by our own feeling really of things. You know, the idea the whole the rhetoric would be your own experience or direct experience. You can't go by just book learning. Uh but but my my point being that once I switched to once I started listening to more to what Ajahn Tong was saying and learned Thai and then sat with him when he taught, it was quite different and it was eye-opening how how orthodox he was and how he always would defer to the teachings. You, you, you could tell sometimes that he was not 
completely 100% sure what the meaning was. Or, I don't, I don't mean sure, but I mean like perhaps uh, not clear or that the, the, the commentaries, for example, themselves are not that clear or the texts are not that clear. But uh, he'd always defer and he would try to explain things based on the text. It wouldn't be, this is what I think. It would be, here's this list of things and then he would explain it as best he could explain it in a way that that he understood it but it was it was uh, very much orthodox it was very much based on the teachings of the of the teachers and their teachers and he always brought up teachings it, he, he brought up the teachings the original teachings which is was very valuable and he was very much into the commentaries and and even thai teachers like he would read Lumpo Chodok stuff and bring up some of the things he said and that sort of thing. But it was this 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 respect for the tradition, respect for the orthodoxy. So I uh, that that was valuable, I think, to be shown that shown how to use because the other thing is it's um it's incomprehensible. I was never able to connect these teachings with my practice there was a disconnect between the the texts and what i was doing and ajahn tong was able to bridge that that was one thing i remarked on quite early how well he was able to bridge the theory and the practice and and but before you you came to to that style of teaching would, would that have been um back back in canada or, or in thailand that that you said there there was um more like the people teaching based off of uh feeling or not really looking into the original texts and commentaries it was uh, in jam tong there's oh. two centers in jam tong one of them is run by lay people still to this day there's two centers thank you bante thank you have a good week everyone sad sadu 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 sadu